extremely messy. Holy cow, boy, that was good. So we'd like to welcome Dr. Stromza. I, I, you're in for a treat of being able to learn about uh, endoimplantology and what he has been able to do in this field. So Dr. Stromza, you've been a member of the IADI for how long? 20 years. There we go, long time. So Dr. Stromza, we're excited to be able to have you. Thank you. Go ahead and we'll Thank you very much. So I understood that the course is lunch lecture. It's the most challenging of all because you guys may have a tendency to just fall asleep. So I propose that we all stand up as I am. No, sorry. And stay up. No, I'm just So we're going to try to make it very entertaining uh, so you won't fall asleep. If you have any question, you can stop me at any time because that's uh, what makes it a little bit more interesting. Yes. Background. Oh, yeah, background. So, the title actually, I just changed it. A, the title now is Transition from Antarctic Challenges, but it actually was supposed to be Antarctic Complications. So, why did I change it and why semantic is important? Um, I was fortunate to be trained by Professor Schindler in Boston University, and he was extremely into semantic. And that's why he never called those radio lucency vision cis or granuloma because from an X-ray standpoint there's no way you can tell. He called them lesion of endodontic origin. And that was actually the the beginning of a formidable journey that I had to understand truly what is happening in endodontics. So we changed that for endodontic challenges. Why? Because truly Challenges, they lead to complications. And the, if they're not managed properly, those challenges, then they turn into issues that could force us to go into transition. And that is very important because it is the perception of challenges that will determine the fate of the tooth and everything thereafter. And we'll understand what I'm saying about this. What do you read in that x-ray? We have a radiologist here, formidable radiologist, but let him talk less. less. What do you guys see on that x-ray? Periapical lesion on the mesial buckle, the marginal DP on the mesial buckle. Or mesial buckle. Yes. The marginal buckle DP on the mesial. Exactly. So in fact, we see two complications. And those complications <coughs> will lead to microbicage and lack of sleep. So who would extract that tooth? Who would retreat that tooth? I would extract it. You would extract it? OK, who would? Thank you for honesty. I want to see the rest of the mouth. You want to see the rest of the mouth? I CBCT. I you want to see CBCT? <laughs> so actually, this case is very, very old. It's probably over 20 years old. That's so not very old, but this old. So, so that even if you treat it endodontically, if I can't get a good marginal seal, or if I do the problem, I think it's going to expose the partition. Doesn't make sense. So. Okay, so let's see what can be done. If you are an endodontist and if your mission is to save teeth, then you will look for what can happen. MB2. Exactly. And eventually you will find it. And eventually you clean, shape, and you know, concrete it. And eventually you will seal it. So 20 years back, when apatology was not as developed as it is now, that was actually the solution of choice. And of course, the crown would have to be redone. But the anatomy, the knowledge of the anatomy was instrumental, and this is not the same case, it's just to show us it is kind of what we have today. <coughs> the anatomy is basically now leading you towards treating those cases more completely because you can see what you're facing. And those are challenges because it's very difficult to find, to see calcified canal, especially on the MB2 level. Nonetheless, as an endodontist, I feel that we can achieve extraordinary results. And I have learned a lot from endo from a bone center, from a bone physiology and pathology. So those, uh, they didn't transfer the images. OK, so those images didn't transfer. That's too bad. So, I may have to switch it a bit. 
but they don't transfer. So it, it, what we can do with that case? So basically, when you have those kind of collision, yes? Oh, sorry, David. So most of the sweeply uh, molar cases, how good is CBCT? Because every time we take a CBCT, if there's a scatter pressure, you get the scatter. So how good you don't, is You don't get much scatter with guitar proteins. You get a lot more scatter with uh, titanium. So, so you still can see the emitter because And actually, so like our, our, our friend, a uh, radiologist, who was telling us, you don't necessarily look at the tooth. You look at the bone. In fact, it's like a word fracture. You cannot see a word fracture unless it's a real big fracture. You cannot see a word fracture on a CBCT, even though you may have a 75 micron precision. You see the bone translation of the word fracture. So eventually, you look at the environment. There's intrinsic and extrinsic value. And the bone is going to be the giveaway of what's going on. So for example, here, you have what we would call now, not a radiolucency, but what we could, we would call it a lesion <coughs> of analytic origin, because by the shape, it's kind of obvious that something is wrong with the root canal. This is a root canal that is not below standard of care, but what we say it's a little bit light, it's a bit short, and maybe that's the reason why this failed. So shall we extract or shall we save? If we extract, hmm? yeah, in a case like this, I think it wouldn't be like a, a, a proper choice to extract. It would be a better choice to actually clean Reclean, reshape, record, and eventually see the result of the bone healing back. And you know, I've been doing endo for probably 25, 30 years now, and the knowledge I've gained dealing with bone lesion, I've transferred it into the realm of implantology. That's why I created endo implantology. So what's interesting about this case is I didn't have to do surgery. I didn't have to numb the patient. By the way, you don't numb those patients, and I didn't do bone grafting. So that was basically the, the ultimate of what one can do as far as the bone healing without doing anything else but a simple retreatment. And that would be very precious to understand for the rest of the world. What about that tooth? There's periodontal probing, there's pus, there's mobility. What would you do? Who would extract and who would sell that tooth? Depending on, the, depending on the vitality, if it's non-vital, I do endo. <coughs> okay. All right. That's a very good point. It could be endoperio. So basically, most of the time, you're absolutely right. So you, have, you should always test and vital test. You're right. If it's vital, you don't want to touch it. Most of the time, those cases will be non-vital. But what this case could be, it's a word fracture. Could be. It could be a word fracture. I would say in doubt, treat it. If you open your access cavity, you don't see a crack line. Even if you have a 12 millimeter pocket, just treat it. And see how the body manage to heal. What's interesting is, and that's fascinating, I didn't curate the granulation tissue. I didn't do nothing. In fact, I didn't do anything. Just cleaning, shaping, irrigation, sometimes calcium hydroxide, and a great seal. And what's important as far as the seal is concerned, is that you want to go to the very you want to go to the very very hand. If you have excess like that, it's not going to be a big deal. What's important is the skill. What we've learned doing endo is, if you follow the rules of engagement, it's very predictable and very reproducible. Now. Despite the fact that endo gave you fantastic results, you have to recognize that sometimes endo won't be the solution. And that, that was a pretty difficult concept to um, entertain from the AAP because nobody wanted to hear about the confrontation of what one is doing. And that's what's led for me to create the transition process. How do you actually transit from either a failing endo or a root fracture? And most of the time, those cases, we have a lot of bone loss. So it becomes a very interesting process to go from one major issue, which is endo issue, translating into a bone issue, to an actual successful implant placement. So take a two like that. This is actually, again, it's a, it's a kind of a meager kind of cleaning, shaping, and, and packing, but it's not below standard of care. Yes, you can read a lesion in here, but the biggest problem we have with this case is Recurrent decay. That's right. And unfortunately, 
this is, I would say, it's an unfortunate complication of an incomplete approach. So root canal therapy is really about treating the canal, but it is one step further because the true seal will be open, or obtained by a builder. And this is how I created, in a sense, the concept of comprehensive endodontics. And comprehensive endodontics incorporate the build-up into endodontics. So it's a difficult concept to, I would say, sell in a way, because when you have referrals, obviously, they expect the care to be sent to them without the build-up. But some of the referrals that I've had understood the, this concept, and then I was able to practice comprehensive endodontics and therefore um, increase tremendously my success rate. So, yes. Uh, before you do the build-up, do you see on the top of the data puncher coronary, the Jacob thing? Yes, yes. I don't understand the question. Before you do the build-up, do you do any kind of seal on the coronal portion of the data puncher? The, the build-up is a seal. Okay. The build-up is a seal. The one secret, quote unquote, is the timing of your work. So if I have a complex case, my first appointment will be dedicated to cleaning, shaping, irrigation, soaking, and elimination of symptoms. And that's the end of it. I don't do more than that. I close my case, and I wait either for the symptom to 